The title of my speech is The Necessity of a Classical Renaissance for the Youth, and I'm identified as the, as the director of the uh, Manhattan Chorus Project, and I suppose that's true. Um, so, I was really pleased that Helga asked me to keynote this panel because the question of classical culture has become extremely dear to me in the recent days and weeks. Um, I've been reflecting quite a bit on what Lynn said repeatedly on the question of metaphor and classical drama. And it's urgent for all generations, not just younger generations, because we are right now in what Helga has identified as a moment of epochal change. That's one thing that we can all be absolutely certain about is what the future will be is not the trajectory of where we think that we are in the present. And my greatest concern is that as a human race we would fail to take advantage of this extraordinary moment of change, this moment of opportunity, because we lack poets, or we suppress our own inner poet in the name of being practical. We need artists and dreamers who can envision the full potential for mankind without mankind ever yet having attained that state of existence. Like Alexander Hamilton, who was raised in the Caribbean doing accounting for a sugar plantation who bore witness to the most hideous forms of slavery, but who nonetheless envisioned a republic which would be worthy of the Gov would, it would be worthy of the consent of the governed, and that would uphold the principles of the divine nature of humankind. We also need to rediscover our sense of irony and our sense of humor. The so-called news media, and it is fake news, uh, and it's actually worse than fake news because it's now quite openly run by treasonous intelligence agents, like the former CIA director, John Brennan. You remember, he loved torture. Um, and his brother once threatened to beat up my husband on the streets of New York um, <laughs> because he recognized him <clears throat> and said something about John. And so he challenged Chris to a fist fight, but luckily uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, I don't think his brother would have survived. Now, um, and he's a major commentator on CNN, or Josh Campbell, who was a top associate of James Comey uh, with the FBI, who's now at MSNBC. And I do find it astounding that in the United States we complain about all the countries that don't have free press when we have the top CIA and FBI officials openly running our news media. So. Is it any wonder that when President Trump announced that he wants to get our troop, troops out of Syria and Afghanistan, the press goes berserk? No, we should be there forever. We should divide Syria. And then uh, they say we should declare war on Turkey, which is, has American nuclear weapons in it, is a NATO country. They say Trump is a warmonger, but he wasn't the one who gloated over the tortured murder of Gaddafi, saying, we came, we saw, he died. Or who said, what difference does it make of the Americans who died in Benghazi? Many people might think that President Trump doesn't look or speak like a poet, although I find there is a poetical quality to some of the things he says and does, good biting irony and humor. I'm not certain that a less abrasive personality could have survived the onslaught of the hyenas in the news media 
or been able to rally tens of thousands of despairing Americans to begin to think that they are citizens again. So imagine the fun that William Shakespeare would have had with a character like Donald Trump, uh, who, together with President Putin, Xi Jinping, and Modi, all of whom are greatly adored by the news media in the United States, could end up becoming the architects of a noble new paradigm for mankind and a world without war. Well, the idea is to have a renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth. So does that mean that we have to be dead first? Um, are we dead? Uh, last week, before coming here, I read a horrible story about a crime in Brooklyn. Two young men, aged 17 and 19, chased a 79-year-old man down the street and took Instagram videos of themselves beating him until his bones were broken. And he was sent to the hospital where at last I knew he was in critical condition. A couple of months before that, at a high school in Long Island, a student was beaten to death on the sidewalk in front of the school. 50 students stood there filming it with their cameras. No one helped him. And we heard this week when I got here that there was another school shooting in California where two students were killed. And the music teacher hid the children in the band room. She blocked the door of the piano. This was her first year teaching. And one of the children who had run in had just gotten a bullet wound. And the music teacher had a first aid kit in her closet to repair bullet wounds. I would say this is a dead civilization. This should not be normal. So what is wrong with us? Our children have become cold-blooded murderers. Is this caused by guns? You might make an argument that individuals who would participate in such crimes shouldn't have guns. But you cannot argue that guns are the cause. And arguing about guns or no guns will have no effect on this. I was reminded of a paper that Lyndon LaRouche wrote in 1999 after the Columbine High School massacre. It was called Star Wars and Littleton. And in it, he asserts that children are being turned into terrorists. And he identified two crucial factors if you want to create terrorists or killers. And this is what he wrote, quote, while you might be watching any small portion of the Star Wars series, the most crucial epistemological issue stands out clearly at first glance. At that moment, you have merely to ask yourself, do these creatures look human to you? How could anyone excuse himself from overlooking the significance of that question? How does one corrupt innocent children into becoming psychotic-like killers? The quick answer to that question is, dehumanize the image of man. The details of the way this leads to the production of youthful Nintendo terrorists are a much more complicated matter. Nonetheless, it is no simplification to say that once the first step dehumanizing the issue of man is accomplished, the axiomatic basis has been established to make war and killing merely a childish game played according to a childish mind's perception of the importance of obeying the rules." Unquote. So you create a confusion first about the difference between a human being and an animal. And then you impose on those people who don't know the difference between a human being and an animal an arbitrary set of rules of conduct which have no ability to take into account the most fundamental principle of the universe, the principle of change. 
and above that, the ability for human beings uniquely to change their species characteristic, and sometimes, which seems more incredible to us all, even their individual personal identity. We ran into this problem of arbitrary rules in 2007 around the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act, which Lyndon LaRouche had designed to stop a bank collapse and prevent millions of Americans from being foreclosed upon and thrown out into the streets. And we would run into this argument repeatedly. Why should we protect them? Didn't they sign the mortgage? The fact that the banks were committing fraud and the brokers were all committing fraud and were trying to rip off unsuspecting elderly and poor people or people who didn't speak English was not considered to be a legitimate reason for abrogating the contract, the arbitrary rule. They signed, therefore they're out. On the dehumanization, uh, perhaps because I'm a daughter of a psychiatrist who worked at a state mental hospital, um, I have become convinced that the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, which began in the United States in the 70s, was also in part an experiment on the rest of us because all of these people who were mentally ill were thrown into the streets. And therefore, in the United States, if you say a homeless person, that is now synonymous with crazy. A homeless person is less than human. And therefore, it's okay to leave them to die on the streets of cold or disease or worse. In California and probably other places, they pay homeless people to fight and film it. The prisons of the United States are filled with people who are mentally ill, and most prisons don't have a psychiatrist. So again, the rights of prisoners can be ignored because they are bad people or they are crazy people. You don't have to worry about the fact that now people can be held in prison for years before they even have a trial because they're too poor to be able to post bail. Last winter in Brooklyn, during our so-called Arctic blast, where the temperatures were minus five and minus 10 degrees centigrade, uh, the prison in Brooklyn had no heat for weeks. And from there, it's not hard to map the same degraded concept of man onto refugees poor people, handicapped people, and so on. But what is the true nature of man? This is the area of LaRouche's breakthrough in the relationship between human creativity and physical economy. And there is a paradox here. Einstein wrote a short paper about it, the question of the individual and society, because a crucial discovery occurs only in the mind of a single sovereign individual. A discovery is not a collective act. But an individual would never be able to arrive at that breakthrough without the benefits of being part of a human society. Also, the discovery that the individual makes is only of value as long as the society is able to assimilate it. This was the breakthrough of the American Revolution and our Declaration of Independence, asserting the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that the government exists to protect the possibility of individual creativity, which can and must be assimilated by the society as a whole. I think that it's necessary in order to be a citizen in a republic to be creative. Otherwise, what is your right to self-government? But people might say, can you demand that people be creative? Well, I'd like us to listen to LaRouche on this question. Um, again, this is a speech 
a different one, uh, in 1994, shortly after he got out of prison in May of 94, we had a conference to create a revival or to create the National Conservatory of Music Movement. We now have what in this country and around the world, we have oppression, but the worst oppression is the oppression of the soul. The worse than mediocrity, the destruction of the sense of personality, the destruction of the ability to concentrate, the destruction of the recognition that one's own self is in the image of God, the inability to recognize one's own creativity, the inability to relive the experience of discovery of a great discoverer of the past, even simply the Pythagorean theorem or something of that sort where the child, by knowing that the child has himself or herself replicated the experience of discovery of a great discoverer, the child knows, I too have that power of creativity. And when the child does that, with a number of cases, the child says, I have this creative power, which I associate with God the Creator. I am in the image of God. It is true. Moses is right. I'm in the image of God, and so is he, and so is she. And then the child wants to celebrate. And what better celebration than a poem? And what better poem than one that is sung properly? And we require music. It's a part of our mind. It's proximate to our powers of creativity. There is a mythology too widely accepted today that creativity is unintelligible, is subject to whim, and cannot be conjured up on demand. Bach, Haydn, Einstein, Kepler, and all other true geniuses, including Lyndon LaRouche, would of course vehemently object to this notion, as they demonstrated with their incredibly productive lives. But it's popularly accepted opinion that we have to wait until we are inspired at some precious golden moment or we take a microdose of some very powerful psychotropic drug and then we can be creative. So what is creativity? Is it innovation? How does one measure it? How does one measure whether something is good for mankind and several speakers have referenced this, uh, that the area of LaRouche's discovery and the relationship between creativity and physical economy, that you increase the potential relative population density, that you create a world in which a greater number of people can live in a given area of land longer, happier, better lives and that this kind of growth is not limited. It can increase from one generation to the next. So take the Apollo mission of President Kennedy. That wasn't just a competition, although Sputnik may have been an initial shock, an inspiring shock. What was required of the American people to successfully land on the moon and return safely to Earth? It was a full-scale mobilization of thousands and the deployment of the best minds to the mission. As Americans saw themselves rising to the challenge, that effect was infectious. Optimism always is. Accomplishing goals for the advancement of mankind, which appeared, which appeared impossible only decades earlier, inspires a thirst for more and greater accomplishments. It is not a coincidence that at the time our nation was engaged in this bold endeavor that the civil rights movement gathered strength, that African nations decided they could secure their sovereignty and independence, that the Peace Corps was organized, that we in the United States believed that poverty could be eliminated. Love of mankind, as demonstrated by Martin Luther King, as a student of Mahatma Gandhi and of Christ, was not considered something for naive Pollyannas, but 
was considered a force of natural law. Well, this inspired optimistic view was too much for Zeus, otherwise known as the British Empire, and a massive onslaught was deployed to transform the culture of the United States from optimism to despair. This was no small effort. You had the Cuban, well, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of President Kennedy, the assassination of Malcolm X, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. You had the Vietnam War. You had MK Ultra pushing drugs on the campuses. You had the introduction of Earth Day. You had the funding of the Beatles as a British-funded invasion of our culture. And by the 1972, the last time an American would walk on the moon, it was a year after Nixon had decoupled the dollar from gold, the United States had become a colorful mess of overgrown flower children and organization men pre prepared to do everything necessary to take care of our own little selves, because that was what we were told was all you could do. Just look out for yourself. Seek pleasure and avoid pain. People were prepared to cannibalize their own parents and their own children just to get ahead. Happily, since it is the nature of human beings to love the good and the beautiful, in spite of the ugliness and destruction, Lyndon LaRouche was able to build and recruit a small but very powerful organization, which you see in part here today, and which I can assure you is again growing in the United States. Uh, President Trump is an optimist because he is a fighter against popular opinion, and that inspires a certain quality of fight in the American people but there is more than that that is required, and I'd like you to hear now from Mr. LaRouche on his 75th birthday. It, I would say if the time is for all of us to be artists in that sense, to get through the bonds of superficiality, break free the search for the service, to live in the realm of ideas, because what is needed now in an agonized world, a world that for many is tumbling apart, is we both from troubled people a sense of real ideas. So they can learn to act not on the basis of how do I interpret these words? How do I simulate beauty? How do I seem to be wise? How do I appear to be smart? To appear to be well informed? But how, rather, a sense of how do I know what to do? And the most important thing to know what to do, how to do, is to be able to reach inside the mind of another person and bring forth within that person an idea which they need. So we are at the point where people want to know what to do, but it is very hard to explain what to do in the form of literal linear instructions. And of course, everyone here knows that Lyndon and Helga LaRouche have written development programs for every corner of the globe and all the way up to the first colony on Mars. But unless people can think creatively, none of this will work. And besides, we have to go beyond Mars and beyond the century. As Lynn said, music is crucial for this renaissance. When LaRouche recruited his second youth movement, early in this millennium, he advocated the formation of choruses and in discussion with John Seegerson, developed a pedagogy uh, based on the Bach motet Jesu meine Freude, uh, which this, as Megan said, was called Combat University on Wheels, worked on actually for years. Both of my co-panelists here have made critical contributions to this music process, which I think you'll gather when you hear from them. Antonella Bonaudi uh, went to Boston to work with our music group there, on, uh, who was working on the Bach Jesu Meine Freude, which had a very obvious effect on their singing. 
and Elvira Green, who, with her great collaborator, Sylvia Olden Lee, brought the knowledge and history of the Negro spiritual uh, to the Schiller Institute. And it is very important to the history of the United States and the current United States. So finally, as part of Mr. LaRouche's 2014 uh, initiative to return to Manhattan as the center of the United States and the tradition of Alexander Hamilton and the Constitution, we created a chorus which has become crucial to the organizing of the whole area. And we have chapters, as people may know, in New Jersey, in Brooklyn, in Queens, and Manhattan. And when we get together to do a concert, we can have anywhere between 80 and 140 singers. And when we're joined by our sister choruses in Virginia and Boston, then we might have 160 or at one point 200 singers. Uh, Lynn proposed that we need to have 1,500 singers, <laughs> which we are still trying to figure out. And I think anyone who worked with Lynn has often found themselves being challenged to do things that they can't understand. <laughs> um, so that's what we're working on. Now what he explained is that the purpose of this choral, this chorus movement, is not just the effect on the audience. And it has definitely been the case, as we've been in existence for about four and a half years, that about a third of our audience is now people who've sung in the chorus. So it is becoming an extended chorus. Um, but he kept talking about the placement of the voice. And he meant this, of course, both very literally, as in the bel canto tra tradition and technique of placement, and the proper Verdi tuning of A at no higher than 432. Uh, and we struggle with these things, but placement is more importantly an idea of the mind, an idea that we can each participate in truth and beauty. And Lynn knew this, and he spoke away the chorus, the way that it would work. We have no auditions for our chorus. We take in everybody, and some people, when they come, cannot even match pitch. Most of them don't read music. Um, but he said what will happen is you will have skilled singers in each section who will sing next to the people who are less skilled, and the new singers will hear this and they will develop confidence. And this very much turned out to be true after some of our early concerts when the music came together, the very amateur singers would be completely blown away by the recognition that they had just participated in something which was extraordinarily beautiful. Um, and that they, they knew they couldn't have done it by themselves, but the chorus could not have done it without them in it. Uh, so what I would like to do in closing is show you a video which is a little under five minutes of the progress of the chorus, starting from the beginning where uh, the way this got started was, people may remember, in 2013-2014, there was the death by strangulation of Eric Garner uh, at the hands of the New York police, and the grand jury had found that there was no wrongdoing, there was no indictment, and people were very angry and upset, and we said, well, why don't we, instead of allowing the FBI to get riots, why don't we elevate this discussion to the question of the dignity of man, that every human life is sacred? And we held a sing-along of Handel's Messiah, which you'll see the beginning of here. To my shock, a hundred people showed up in six days of organizing. Um, and also, tragically, the day we held that, two police officers were gunned down in their car just to underscore how urgent it was that we get this to a higher level. Um, you will see the, uh, just the teeny snip of a series of concerts that we did on the 15th anniversary of 9-11. And I will say at that time, our organization was mobilized to get the JASTA bill through the Congress, Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, because so far the Saudis had not been able to be prosecuted. And it was interesting to me that the act passed uh, with a veto-proof majority. Obama tried to veto it, and the Congress 
was overwhelming, and the music was part of that. Also, as one of the singers pointed out to me, going back to the first case this year, the, the officer who, who strangled Eric Garner was finally fired from the police force. So my friend, the tenor soloist, was simply making the point that the music seems to go hand in hand with justice. Uh, you will also see on here a performance we did after the terrible tragedy of the Alexandrov Ensemble, the Russian Red Army Chorus, died in a plane crash in the Black Sea on Christmas Day as they were traveling to Syria to visit the troops, and we held a memorial um, at the teardrop, which was a gift of Putin to the United States after 9-11. We were joined by the, um, I forget what, the ceremonial unit of the New York City Police Department because the Red Army Chorus, they had been having a military choral competition on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and the police chorus was there, and the Russian chorus had a little boy with a flower uh, and a soloist who sang God Bless America and presented this as a very touching tribute to the Americans. Um, the baritone soloist who sang that was one of the people who died in that plane crash. So the New York police uh, joined us for this. And then you will see last on it um, our performance in May this past year of the Mozart Vespers. And I think, we'll see, I hope you will notice an improvement in the choral process from the beginning to end. It's just little snips.
so. <laughs> Um, we need about 1,000 more singers. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Next, um, sorry, I'm moderating and finishing, but thank you. We will have Antonella Finaudi. Yes. Dear Helga, Dear friends of the Schiller Institute and of the La Rouge Pack, thank you for this precious time during which I will try to give an idea of the importance of Lyndon's action for the good and progress of humanity. Let me begin straight away. In 1737, in Leipzig, Lorenz Mitzler, who was a student of Johann Sebastian Bach, created a semi-secret society of the musical sciences. In order to be admitted, one had to present one's own musical composition of a mathematical nature and a portrait of oneself. Mitzler's aim was to show the connection between music and mathematics. The motto of the society was, in fact, music is the sound of mathematics. A bit like saying that the word is the sound of poetry or that mathematics is the language of physics and science. The aim of the society was to take music back to its Pythagorean origin, which is why it also attracted the participation Georg Friedrich Handel. Johann Sebastian Bach officially entered the society in 1747. His art of fugue and his Goldberg variations are a brilliant expression of music made according to the principle of geometric and arithmetic symmetry, as were composition by Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, up to Stravinsky. These symmetries are similar to those of the golden ratio, whose highest expression is the canon. Another type of canon is that of Vitruvius, illustrated by Leonardo in his drawing, The Vitruvian Man, a condensate of mathematical and harmonic knowledge of human body. Leonardo also studied the philotaxis that proceeds according to the principles of the golden proportion expressed by the irrational number 0 0.618, which was always considered as a representation of the universal law of harmony. The ratio of the golden section or golden proportion is expressed in a golden spiral that shapes our cochlea, which then send spiral signals to our brain and our mind by obeying a natural structure and shaping it, shaping it in turn, causing us to unconsciously recognize the golden language, the beautiful proportion when we encounter it in art. The same applies to sight, because similarly, the cones that collect the lights, signals, are also a golden spiral. A close relative of the golden section is the Fibonacci series that orders sequences in plant and human life. All proteins have five sides created according to the golden ratio. Even the helix of DNA is in golden ratio, expressed by Fibonacci numbers. Some spectacular galaxies are clearly in a golden spiral. The exit from a planetary orbit is calculated as a golden spiral. And so is the progression of the collapse of the stars. 
as well as the harmonic ratios of the Pythagorean scale. If we listened to music in the golden proportion, this would be in harmony with biology and with harmonic perception. Lyndon LaRouche studied this geometric proportion in his fundamental manual of the rudiments of tuning and registration. He did so through the human voice. This because in addition to being the basic instrument for music, was defined by him as a truly golden living process. We know that to sing well means to have an educated ear. When you study singing, you educate the voice and the ear together, just as we educate the mind to proportion and harmonic beauty. A beautiful voice is the expression of a beautiful air, just as a beautiful composition is the result of a beautiful mind. And when we listen to it, we are actually connected with a beautiful mind that created it. LaRouche and the Schiller Institute have clearly postulated how much the voice and the mind through the ear, which is naturally based on the golden ratio, are one whole. So even music, if it, is, it really wants to be an expression of the music and the Polonian beauty, should be structured with golden relationships between the, deg the, excuse, the degrees. The golden ration belongs to the knowledge secretly transmitted. That is why it was defined as sacred. And LaRouche says that there is nothing mysterious or mystical about seeing how the golden section is an absolute value of the living processes. As further confirmation of the discoveries of Fibonacci and Leonardo, Kepler inspired by Plato's Timaeus, published in 1597, the monumental Mysterium Cosmographicum, demonstrating that the solar system and the proportions of its planetary orbits derive from the fifth five platonic solids and the golden section. Just as the angular speeds of the planets in their elliptical orbits are proportioned according to the same ratios as the fundamental musical intervals. With respect to the astronomical values of Kepler, LaRouche defined the C at 256 cycles per second as Kepler's interval in the solar system. In 1800s, Carl Friedrich Gauss introduced conical spiral action instead of the pure circular action proposed by Kepler. And LaRouche demonstrated just that conical spiral action in the voice of bel canto, which means beautiful singing. It seems that the physicist Joel Sternheimer, a passionate musician, show that elementary particles are organized according to an order closely related to the musical scale based on the C at 256 hertz. The frequencies of the proton is 2.26876 per 10 at the 23rd, a value that corresponds almost exactly to the G of the 69th octave above, above the C at 256 hertz. In biophysical optics research, it has been demonstrated that the maximum absorption of electromagnetic radiation of DNA corresponds to a precise value 
that is at the 42nd octave above the C at 256. There are just a few examples which confirm with present day discoveries how much the non-aligned physicist knew about the scientific intonation of 432 hertz for the A. The A desired by Verdi, the genius, whose aesthetic taste and knowledge was based on the idea of beautiful voice and music. There's an enlightening definition of the voice by Lyndon LaRouche, a definition I always perceived, showing that sometimes you know without knowing that you know. I summarize it. The human voice is for sound what the laser is for light. It is an acoustic laser generating the maximum density of electromagnetic singularities by the action of unity. Now, I wonder, is this why when we listen to a beautiful voice, it is as, as if we had the projection in our minds of a world of colors and shapes with which needs no justification to exist other than beauty? So far, I've contributed only a little to remember Lyndon's scientific and artistic commitment from which we all learn. For me, he is a maestro in the ancient classical Socratic sense. A maestro is someone who, by his example, recalls and enlightens what is latent in others. A maestro is someone who makes of his life a work of art. His action is both scientific and artistic to seek and communicate knowledge, knowledge of the human being and of the law that govern the world, laws to which man must conform to build a harmonious, just, and happy society. On the pediment of the temple of Delphi is written, know yourself, and you will know the universe and the gods, because everything obeys the same laws. Knowledge then becomes consciousness in the sense of an ethical obligation to realize the principle that distances us from the life of the brutes, as Dante urged us in the canto of Ulysses in the Inferno. You were not made to live as brutes, but to follow virtues and knowledge. Surely, LaRouche has given me much more than I can ever give back. He enlightened in me a passion for all aspects of music and science, and they are countless and fascinating. A research that can constantly enrich me and change my vision of the world. My memory of LaRouche is one of admiration, esteem, and affection. Because whoever knows how to light the spark, a spark colored by his torch in the mind of man, is animated by a deep love for the good of humanity. And Lyndon LaRouche has lit it in each one of us. That is why we are here. Thank you.
finally, uh, we will hear from Elvira Green on True Freedom Through True Art, The Negro Spiritual's Unique Contribution to Classical Literacy in America. All black and unknown bards of long ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How, in your darkness, did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first, from midst his bonds, lifted his eyes? Who first? from out the still watch, lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark-kept soul, burst into song. Part of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus? On its strains, his spirit must have mightily flowed free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. Who heard, roll, Jordan, roll, roll, Jordan, roll. I want to go to heaven when I die to hear old Jordan roll. Whose star would I saw swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home? And who was he that breathed that comforting melodic sigh? Nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory, hallelujah. What merely living clod, what captive thing could up toward God through all its darkness grope and find within its deadening heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, hope, and faith. How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music heard not with the ears? How sound the elusive reed so seldom blown, which stares the sound or melts the heart to tears. Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation ever heard a nobler theme than go down Moses. Way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Sure are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds. Such tones there were that helped make history when times were young. There is a wide, wide wonder in it all that from the degraded rest and servile toil, the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil. Old black slave singers, gone, forgot, unfazed, you, you alone, 
of all the long, long line of those who sung untaught, unknown, unnamed, have stretched out upward seeking the divine. You sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, no chant of bloody war, no exulting paean of arms, worn triumphs, but your humble strings you touched in chord with music of the highest heaven. You sang far better than you knew the songs that for your listeners' hungry hearts sufficed still live. But more than this to you belongs. You sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. From whom did these songs spring? These songs unsurpassed among the folk songs of the world and in the poignancy of their beauty unequaled. It would have been a noble achievement if the American settlers, having a common language and heritage, seeking liberty in a new land, faced with the task of conquering untamed nature, and stared with a hope of building an empire, had created a body of folk songs comparable to the Negro spirituals. In 1619, 400 years ago, a Dutch ship landed 20 African natives at Jamestown, Virginia. As many as had survived the passage were immediately thrown into slavery. Here they were, cut off from the moorings of their native culture, scattered without regard to their old tribal relations, having to adjust themselves to a completely alien civilization, having to learn a strange language, and moreover, held under an increasingly harsh system of slavery. Yet, it was from these people that this mass of noble music sprang. This music, which is America's only folk music, the finest distinctive artistic contribution she has to offer the world. The music of Go Down Moses, Deep River, Stand Still Jordan, Walk Together Children, Roll, Jordan, roll, ride on King Jesus. As examples, is always noble, and the sentiment of the spirituals is always exalted. Never does their philosophy fall below the highest and purest motives of the heart. All the true spirituals possess dignity. There are doubtless many people who have heard these songs sung only on vaudeville or theatrical stages and have laughed uproariously at them because they were presented in humorous vein. They may have thought of them as a new sort of ragtime or menstrual song. Therefore, these spirituals must be clothed in their primitive dignity to be properly appreciated and understood. Although the spirituals have been overwhelmingly accredited to the Negro as his own original creation, there have been critics who have denied that they were original. The opinions of these critics is unsound. It is neither based on scientific nor historical inquiry, rather, on an unwillingness, an unwillingness to concede the creation of so much pure beauty to a people they wish, even to this day, to feel to be absolutely inferior. In Mr. James Weldon Johnson's writing, he referred to the quote, miracle, end quote, of the Negro spiritual emanating from the music 
which the American Negro heard their masters sing, chiefly religious music. The Negro spirituals were not conceived out of an indebtedness to their white masters. The power to frame the poetic phrases that make the titles of so many spirituals indicate the power to create the songs. When the Fisk Jubilee Singers toured England, Scotland, and Germany, spending eight months in Germany alone, their concerts were attended by most musically cultured and sophisticated people, as well as the general public. Their European concerts constituted both an artistic sensation and a financial success for Fisk University, neither of which results could have been attained had their songs been mere imitations of European folk music or adaptations of European airs. The late Sylvia Olden Lee, the renowned exponent of the Negro spirituals, and as a member of the Cultural Advisory Board of the Schiller Institute, compiled a massive catalog of spirituals arranged by her and her contemporaries. These included Hall Johnson, Thomas Kerr, Edward Boatner, Margaret Bonds, Undine Smith Moore, John W. Work Sr., to name a few. Sylvia, ah, with whom I worked many years, traveled the world as a coach, musical historian, pianist, and accompanist to many renowned artists, both singers and instrumentalists. The memoirs of Sylvia Olden Lee, premier African-American classical vocal coach, reads like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ms. Lee. A few classically trained African-Americans as committed performers, performers of the Negro spiritual in our era include Marian Anderson, William Warfield, Robert McFerrin, George Shirley, Leontine Price, Kathleen Battle, and the late Jesse Norman. Indeed, the Negro Spiritual's unique but most relevant contribution to classical literacy in America lends itself to an ever-widening musical opportunity in that its multicultural and multi-ethnic, quote, Americans, end quote, are more open to embracing this musical experience by including these songs in their choral and solo repertoire. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the National Association of Negro Musicians, Inc., an organization created by James Weldon Johnson, the author of the poem I recited at the opening of this statement. This organization was founded only two months after Mr. Johnson spoke in May of 1919 at the National Conference on Lynching. That conference was held at Carnegie Hall. I am proud to announce that next month, December 16th, a core of singers associated with the National Association of Negro Musicians will join the chorus on stage at that same Carnegie Hall to sing the Ode to Joy, the choral finale of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Mr. Johnson knew and lived the lessons of the spirituals. Human dignity is the birthright and the province of every human soul. This was Beethoven's conviction, and we celebrate that. Yet, 
not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation ever heard a theme more nobler than go down Moses. We have always known that it is through beauty of the soul that one proceeds to true freedom. That is the freedom song that is at the heart of every Negro spiritual, the beauty of the human soul. So I think we can have some discussion and I wanted to invite the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga Zepp-LaRouche, to come up here and join us for this. I will tell a little story that Helga may not be aware of about the first time that I saw her, although we didn't get to talk. And I think it was shortly after I heard Lynn give a speech which caused me to have a migraine headache for three days. <laughs> um, which was the development is the name for peace and being a naive little Quaker girl, I always felt like I should be active in something or other, but that the planet really had gotten so much better than it was during the days the Quakers were fight fighting slavery that, you know, things just weren't evil anymore. And uh, what Lynn described was and there were many greetings from leaders from Africa and South America, and it suddenly struck me that there were people who actually intended to do evil, that these countries were not poor because they had bad weather or something like that, but you had a policy of evil, and that was when I decided as an American, I had a lot more power than people who were starving to death somewhere in Malawi and that I had to do something. Now the next conference I went to, Lynn was speaking and Helga was seated next to him as she is there. And Lynn got up to go and make his speech and Helga reached up and gave him a pinch in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea what they said. I was 21 years old, but all I remembered was that pinch and decided that this must be a person that I should get to know someday. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you have something you'd like to say now or wait and see what questions, wait and see what questions we have. Okay, so, oh. Yep, hello. Um, I have a short anecdote. You mentioned Sylvia Oden Lee. I had the, the pleasure and the honor of traveling with her and a group of uh, musicians uh, for I think about three weeks in Germany. And uh, Sylvia would always be in the back of the bus, uh, lying on top of the luggage. Yes. And she would give uh, pedagogical uh, explanations and she would uh, be very critical of the, of the musicians and so anyway. We were driving on the Autobahn and uh, I noticed that a police car was coming very close, very next to us and I said, oh my God. They don't have seat belts on, this woman is lying on top of the luggage, this is going to be a big problem, right? So, very nice young policeman and said, looked in the back and then he looked at me, I was the only uh, white person in the car, and uh, said, let me see your license please, and I said yes, and he said, what are you doing? I said, uh, we're traveling throughout Germany, uh, these are uh, African American musicians from America, and it's a campaign against racism. He said, oh. That's very nice. He said, follow me and we will take you to your next stop with the, with the blue lights flying, right? And he didn't uh, care about the seat belts or Sylvia lying on top of the luggage. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. My name is Marsha Mary Baker. I'm so glad and grateful to be here from the United States. So to Helga and the panelists and the moderator, Diane, 
I need to make just a very short mention about someone who isn't here. And if there's a question, maybe especially Diane, who worked with him last, if not Helga, might say something. But that person is Hal Cooper. Dr. Hal B.H. Cooper would love to be here from Seattle, Washington. He passed away in October, October 25. And I say that because many in the room know him personally or by his work. And so the video we saw earlier today from Lynn saying, what are you going to do about the billions who follow you? Hal did something, I think. I understand, Helga, that it was the, uh, well, he was a transportation engineer from the United States, very American, trained in Texas and California and Iowa. And he, uh, I understand in the early 1990s, Helga and Lynn had an associate at a transportation conference in London, and Hal was met and Hal had a natural interest in the new Silk Road and did a world map for the 1996 Eurasian Land Bridge report. Well, fast forward to today, 25 years later, and Hal was so thrilled to do map everything. The Bering Strait, Africa, South America, a new Panama Canal. You would phone Hal and say, I'm interested in the Strait of Hormuz, and you would have six maps of the connection to the new Silk Road. I'm sure he would love to hear this music. He was not in the chorus, but when, Helga, you always talk about we should respond to the spirit of the new Silk Road, I think Hal responded to the logistics of the new Silk Road. <laughs> so you'll see his work in all these languages and these reports here. And Diane, I think you were the last to work with him. In ill health, he came to New York because the infrastructure is collapsing there along with the social condition you described. Thanks. Yeah, he was wonderful. Um, I'll say a little about Hal, and I don't know if you want to say also what was amazing about Hal, as Marsha described, he would come up and we, I became aware of, or acutely aware, I should say, of the collapsing state of the New York public transportation system. Actually, during that 2016, the concerts, and actually 2017, when we had the memorial, the centennial anniversary of Sylvia Lee's birth, because we had this huge chorus of 210 people, and we were joined by different church choruses, and people kept showing up late at the rehearsals. And the reason they were late was the subway caught on fire, or the train shut down, or it flooded, or, I mean, a complete breakdown. And uh, Lynn said we should, we should create a committee to investigate the collapse of the transportation in the New York metropolitan area. So of course we called Hal Cooper who came out and he met with some of us and people from the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and he spoke at a conference and the thing that I found the most remarkable about him is as we all know at these conferences we're supposed to stay within certain limits of how long you're supposed to speak and Hal would send to the AV people about 7,000 slides. And you would say, this is impossible. How can he show, I mean, maybe it was 100 or 200 slides in a 15 minute speech. And is he really going to do this? And, and he was so organized in his thinking and he had the entire world, like Lynn, it was, the entire world, every detail, every mountain, every everything was in his mind. And he would give his speech in 15 minutes and show you 200 slides. And it was completely amazing. Uh, and it really was an enormous privilege to work with him. He also, every time he spoke, <coughs> expressed his great gratitude for Lyndon LaRouche and spoke of Lynn and Helga as the originators of the World Land Bridge and the Silk Road and so on. So um, it's definitely a terrible loss, but we are going to succeed in doing what, what he and Lynn and Helga have envisioned. Um, 
Yeah, I think that if the history of how the new Silk Road World Land Bridge came into being will ever be written by some historians, Hal Cooper will have a very prominent name uh, in that because what Diane just said, you know, he was passionate about uh, making maps, making concrete suggestions, you know, for African industrialization, for, you know, we had several meetings which were not even published, you know, where Lynn and I and he would have meetings with experts from different countries uh, where he would provide maps and these were not even mentioned, you know, because these were private meetings. But if you look at how ideas become realized, it takes passion, you know. So I think I want to give a big tribute to Hal Cooper who, you know, for his work already has become an immortal person. I, I, I have a, uh, an anecdote from Sylvia, which I think gets to one of the things that Lynn was always talking about and that Diane exemplifies as the director of the Schiller Institute in New York City Chorus. You know, Lynn always talked about the fact that people have to give up their fears. And one of the fears people have is getting up and singing. And Sylvia had a unique way of dealing with this. I had the honor of hosting her at my house on a number of occasions when she came with Bill Warfield to Houston and to Los Angeles. And on one of these occasions, there was a National Association of Negro Musicians conference. And Sylvia was conducting a workshop. And she could be quite tough, quite fear, fearless and taking on problems. And so she said, okay, who would like to get up and sing and I'll coach you. And you looked around and these were professionals and, and highly trained amateurs. No one got up. So finally, William Warfield raised his hand and he said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And so she said, what do you want to sing? And he, I can't remember I, what, what it was, but he, he started singing and she cut him off right away. And she said, where'd you get that accent? Don't you know how to speak the vernacular? And he said, oh no, Miss Sylvia, can you tell me? And it was one of these funny things where the two of them were showing how silly it is to be afraid of your own voice. And by doing that, Sylvia actually empowered everyone else, and Bill, everyone else to get up and sing. And I think it's important that this idea of the choral principle, that when we talk about having to have the courage to speak the truth to power, you've got to find your own voice. And one of the ways you can do that is find that when you sing with others, it's, it's something of great beauty and you find that beauty in yourself. So I'd like to encourage everyone who's not singing in the chorus to start singing. I would just like to add in that regard where my mentor, Sylvia Olden Lee, and my grandmother, Elvira Catherine Pennington Watson are the two women who have inspired me to still be alive at this beautiful place at this beautiful time. Mrs. Lee called me once and that this is who she is and she said, I need you to come to Virginia. And I said, what for? She said, just get here. <laughs> and I did because Sylvia Lee said, get there. And that gave me this incredible honor in my life to have an experience to meet Mr. LaRouche and his incredible first-hand partner, Helga LaRouche. She called me a second time to say, uh, I'm at the National Association of Negro Musicians Conference. I need you here. I said, why? Get here. And so I got on the plane and I got there. Sylvia Lee, once you uh, get over yourself and, and begin to understand that this woman was put in this being on this planet to give as much joy, love, knowledge, understanding, and this beautiful spirit of meeting people and becoming absorbed 
and what that meant in your meeting of people. And so I sit here absorbed in Mr. LaRouche and his incredible mate, Hilda, and in this, and what this organization stands for. I've been an advocate for children in the arts for many, many years now. And so that is my mission with this organization, is to work with preteens to get them to understand their importance while they're on this planet. And so I just wanted to share this little bit of information because where I am now, and I say it to everyone, it is Sylvia Lee who takes no for an answer. Who takes no? No, you will not do it. No, I will not let you do it. That's her answer, which means it gets done. Just a few words to congratulate because this uh, part of music is amazing. It's something that I didn't know about uh, Lynn. And uh, provided that we connect with Leonardo after five year, 500 years, I let you know, maybe you know that Leonardo was inventor of an instrument named the Viola Organista. And I had the chance a few months ago to listen directly to the constructor of this uh, uh, instrument in Krakow. It was amazing how we can interpret the past looking to the future. Again, our past is our future, and I think this is one of the lectures of Lyndon, and this is one of my best uh, uh, idea that I have to be here with you, and I hope to continue with you this uh, extraordinary experiment of life with the heart and the soul. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have also, in keeping with this uh, question of science, wanted to ask Antonella to speak about something. Um, because one of the campaigns that Lynn waged relentlessly was to lower the pitch, to get back to the Verdi tuning. And many people, frankly, still have a confusion about this, even though we recruited and you recruited and Liliana, many of the greatest opera singers ever, but if you would say something about this, because I do think it's an important part of uh, getting more people to be singing. I have to remember um, an action we did with Lyndon and uh, uh, the whole uh, Schiller Institute that took place everywhere in the world, really. So all the musicians and scientists, they knew about how the voice can be treated and how the voice can be uh, damaged uh, with a, a wrong pitch. Um, we did this campaign and I joined, I was invited to take the place of another singer um, Carlo Bergonzi. I was in uh, Buseto, that is the patria of the bel canto of Verdi, and I was there, just a younger <laughs> singer, uh, a practical singer, um, just to have fun, a great fun with voice and the beautiful music. So I entered this world of scientific uh, music, this part of music. And I came to, uh, I got to know that uh, a violin in, um, in Cremona, a violin of Cremona was cracked, was killed, because a musician used a wrong pitch. You know that the um, ponticello, is called ponticello, is the part that um, connect the chords and support the um, tension of the chords 
on the, the surface of the violin. So if you have um, a normal, natural tension, you can, um, the piano can support 24 kilos. But if you increase the tension, our chords are no more natural, our um, strings. So the tension is too much. It's much more than 24 kilos. And this cracked the violin. So in, they were crazy about this because kill a violin is something <laughs> incredible. And there was another musician, a musician very important uh, for our culture, is von Karajan. Von Karajan started to increase the pitch of the violins because for the CDs was important to increase the brilliance. Because when you registered a CD, you cut the lowest part of um, the sound and the highest part. So you have just a, a part of the whole sound. To avoid this poorness of the sound, you need to increase the pitch. But this um, brings you to uh, faster the music because the sound is no more so big, so rich, so deep somehow, so noble. And then you have to faster the music. And uh, when you listen to this, your ear is completely... Uh, come on, what destroyed and is no more natural and you change also your air. And this, this is not enough. The voices, the voices at the beginning of an opera, they bring the same pitch of the orchestra. If you bring this pitch at the beginning, you are sure that at the end of the opera, you have no more that pitch because the instruments are, are warmer. And so if you start at 440, you will finish at 445. This is why, this is why also Verdi and the great musician, uh, they know that at the end of an opera, they cannot put a cavatina somehow is called this way. So a great aria with great difficulty and a cabaletta and everything like that. So the whole opera is uh, built up to consider this. So the warm up of the instrument and the increasing of the pitch. So if you start at 440, mm, okay, it's already difficult. And we, we were, starting at 445 sometimes. So it was really difficult. 442, 32, we did an uh, experiment, many experiment with um, the Schiller Institute. Is wow, an experience <laughs> incredible. Because you, uh, most with, with Verdi, uh, but also Donizetti, you know, and Bellini, you change the shape of the sound. Because we are an instrument, we are cutted like another instrument. And to get the richest sound, the richest color and shape of the sound, you must sing in the best, best placement for your instrument. And singing at for 32, most for Verdi, it allows you to avoid a dangerous bridge the voice has. It's called Passaggio. And we did this in, uh, with Attila, I did with Attila, I did with um, Aida. And you, it's easy. It's easy to sing. It's really 
natural. It's like to give, you can give everything. You can be there completely. You can somehow forget technique. Because now we have to study much more than 100 years ago or, or, or more. Because our voice is a natural instrument. We didn't change so much <laughs> in 200 year, years. So we must absolutely sing directly and give to beauty naturally, because beautiness is naturally. And uh, La Rouge, I think, is he knew exactly, I think, uh, not only by with his scientific knowledge. When you are connected in yourself with beautiness, you know what beautiness is by yourself without studying. Sometimes you need to study to reach something that natural. We, now we have to study to understand what is natural. So we reach this um, knowledge because we, we, f we forgot a lot about what natural is and what beauty how much beautiful the voice can be, how much uh, beautiful the mind can be, and how our life can be. So we adapted ourselves to something that is not natural, and we must absolutely study to get back, get back to our natural um, beautiness. So I, I, I can only thank um, Lyndon for this. I actually would like to add one thought to this whole discussion so far, and that is that in a certain sense we should not have had this panel at the end because it's really the most important discussion because, you know, Friedrich Schiller, as you know, basically after the collapse of the French Revolution, or the, you know, the turning into Jacobin terror, he wrote the aesthetical letters. And in those, he made the emphatic point that from now on, any improvement in politics would only come through the aesthetical education of men. Now, I think that that is absolutely true. I believe in, this is the reason why I'm in politics. If I would not believe that you can improve human beings as they are, through the aesthetical education, you know, I would not be here. Uh, <clears throat> because it is so clear that the population as they are now are awful. We all know that. The people of the present culture are degenerate, they are stupid, they allow that they be absolutely manipulated. You know, why do they not get up and stand up against the policies which are about to destroy all of us? Why, why are the people so numbed, you know? They're numb, they're not awake, you know? And I think that the point, therefore, what Schiller has been <clears throat> saying, you know, and which is in total cohesion with what Lynn, Lynn's whole life was, is that, you know, people have to improve and become better people. And the way to do it is through the aesthetical education, through great classical art. And Schiller has developed this whole beautiful theory why this is so. He says, you know, people who in their daily life are, you know, doing this and that, and they, you know, are banal and they are, you know, doing bad things. So you have to catch them in their leisure. And in the leisure, you have to ennoble them through great art. And when people sink down in the piece of art, so to speak, you know, if they involve themselves, let it be a great painting of Leonardo da Vinci of Rembrandt, or let it be a German lead, or let it be an American spiritual, they become better people in the moment when they involve their mind with the composer, with the singer, with the orchestra, they, for that moment, 
are stopping to be greedy. They don't think about themselves anymore. So the more people do that, you know, the more they become better people. And to some people, I would even prescribe that they should do nothing else to not give them any room to be nasty in between. <laughs> so I, I think this question, you know, is extremely important because, I mean, if we want to have any chance to save this humanity from the abyss where we are at, it can only be through the aesthetical education. And I've said this many times that, you know, I don't, I don't believe the Chinese are this or that. I look at it, you know, because there's this whole anti-China campaign. But Xi Jinping is on the record of having discussed with the students, with the artists, the extreme significance of aesthetical education because it creates a more beautiful mind and a more beautiful soul. Now, I have not heard any Western leader talk like that. I have not heard Merkel or, for that matter, Mr. Trump. Uh, I have not heard anybody speak about the need to, to, to have the highest moral standard in the classical art for the sake of the moral improvement of their own population. And for me, this is an extremely important criteria. So Schiller, uh, and I really appreciated what you said, you know, in terms of the uh, <clears throat> the transparent, the, in, the intelligible, uh, the intelligibleness, is that a word? No. The, in, <laughs> the, the, the fact that you can um, make beauty intelligible, you know, that it's not an arbitrary, this was the big debate between Schiller and Kant, where Kant in his critique of, um, um, uh, uh, not not the judgment. The, the uh, what? Uh, no, no. Uh, anyway, one of the critiques of Kant, uh, Kant, which Schiller got, he he got so upset because Kant there said that in great art you cannot recognize, or if you recognize the intention of the artist, it is bad. Uh, so Schiller said, what is this, when I, and, and Kant actually said, if I throw an arabesque against the wall and I do not see the plan behind it, that is more beautiful than if I see the plan of the artist. And that is so absolutely wrong. This is, you know, where you have today arbitrariness in art, in, in people call things art which are completely ugly. And Schiller, in his famous debate with uh, Körner, his very close friend, had this absolutely necessary discussion that the, it is only beautiful art which deserves the name. Art which is not beautiful should not be tolerated to be called art. And that is against the zeitgeist, naturally, because with the romantics, which was really the beginning of the evil, and it was a conscious oligarchical attack against the classics, they took apart the classical form of art by introducing you know, arbitrariness, the day is like the night, everything is a dream, you know, no form. This whole fight for the aesthetical laws which Schiller and Goethe uh, had entertained for 10 years, where they <clears throat> went again to the Greek idea that beauty, truth, and the good are identical. This is very, very important. So out of that, they had developed aesthetical laws which they claimed are as universal and as lasting as laws of the physics, the physical universe. And this is what Lynn always talked about, that there is no, absolutely no difference in the creative faculties which have access to the hypothesis for the next new scientific discovery and the question of classical art. So if you take the form apart, if you, if you destroy everything and say, you know, whatever a monkey does with a pot of color throwing it against the wall, which they call art nowadays, you know, th this is something we have to fight against. And I think you know, Schiller, the Schiller Institute was from the beginning intended to be a renaissance movement of people who would fight to get back to the classical ideas of you know, great classical art in all areas, music, poetry, painting, architecture, uh, just every expression of human uh, artistic capability. And 
I really want to call on you to be part of that Renaissance movement because you know you are in a world in which everything is allowed. You know, every everything, whatever people think is is you know, if you read the newspapers, somebody comes up with an, a more crazy idea than the person yesterday, and they find the headlines. You know, and while on the on the discussion of principles of truth, of beauty, of you know, that which elevates people, that is not newsworthy. And there's another idea which I think is very important, and that is that Schiller, <coughs> uh, in the aesthetical letters, said you know, that beauty is something which is created by reason. And if something beautiful in the contemporary world co coincides with that notion of reason, then it is beautiful. But you don't need to have the, exper the <coughs> experience of the sensuous experience of beauty first and then derive the notion of reason. It works the other way around. And this is why what, what Antonella was developing is so absolutely crucial because it is, you know, there is something in, in uh, the uh, golden mean and all these measurements which, which are the measurement of why something is beautiful and not. And naturally, what Elvira, what you were saying about, you know, that this is uh, the best way to educate the emotion. Uh, it comes from the heart. And if you don't transform the emotions of people, you know, you are not doing the job. I mean, everybody knows you know, there are excellent people, you know, who are brilliant in their uh, whatever they do. But then they go home and beat their wife, you know. So obviously you have a problem and you need to educate the emotions of such people, you know. And I really believe that we only will be human when, you know, people really become classical thinkers. And Lynn, you know, in many of his writings said you need a Riemannian mindset, a classical mindset for the society to survive. And that is why I really think we are on the verge of really launching this cultural renaissance. And, you know, I think it's, it's a great moment of time, but we need many, many more people to join in this effort. And I really, I'm recognizing Theo, who is a member of the board of the Schiller Institute since, since many, many years. And, you know, I... I would invite all of you to be on the board. That's a little bit too much, but all, all become activists and, and really fight for this, for this idea. Okay, yeah. Yeah, two things uh, which in a way are um, signs of a potential uh, renaissance. So one is negative, so to speak, and the other one positive. Uh, con concerning uh, art, what is called art uh, today, uh, and especially contemporary art, uh, one thing which is very important is that it's totally linked uh, to the financial uh, scam. Uh, just because it is an investment. So you have, for example, when people, uh, uh, the big people who have uh, billionaires, you know, when they want to uh, save their money, so to speak, uh, they will invest in contemporary art and they put it in a safe and uh, the same way that uh, uh, money with no value is being created uh, out of nothing, exactly the same way value is being created out of art just by saying this is art because I decide that it is art. And then you have a network of galleries of people uh, who are there and decide who is the artist, who has the highest values, and it's just pure uh, speculation. So it is not art at all. That's one thing. But you have now people who are starting to call the, uh, the, 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 the game and denounce that, which is very interesting. The other thing is that uh, last year, uh, we were invited to a um, performance of Le Traviata, which has been performed in Paris in A432. And I think this really uh, showed the, how the ideas are traveling through times. 
uh, because it was uh, directly a reflection of our campaign in 1986. And uh, we went uh, to this uh, performance. It was very nice, I must say. It was in one of the big uh, theater of Paris. It was not in some remote place. It was totally full. People just uh, loved it tremendously. And then we went to talk with the uh, um, uh, director. Uh, and uh, he explained to us how that it was a project uh, from many years ago. And, you know, he said explicitly that he discovered these ideas. The guy is a fan about the A432, and he discovered it through uh, our campaign of the Schiller Institute. So this was uh, very interesting, very impressive. Uh, and uh, then he explained how he had to battle and fight uh, to uh, make it a reality. And he was even saying, well, if I would have to do it again, I would hesitate. So much it was a fight uh, to make it happen. And it was not so much fight with the musicians, that all the structure which is around and it was really impressive because I don't know for other country, but at least in France, it is clear that people know, know that art, science, knowledge is a real power. So that's why you have a caste which is trying to control everything which is linked to uh, knowledge. And in that instance, it was very interesting because it was a big success. Again, you had a lot of people there. People were just totally happy, beaming. And uh, well, I, it, it shows how uh, what we are doing at some point uh, is giving uh, people ideas and the courage uh, to fight and make it happen. So. Thank you for that. I would like to briefly speak on what I see is a missing component in all of our organizations, well established or in the process of being established. What I see as an advocate for young people in the arts is that we forget that those young minds of preteens can start a whole new civilization of thought in all of these areas. So I would like to ask all of you to consider, not so much even in the schools, if you are from a family and you've got five grandchildren, have a conversation with them about this very thing called life. Have them to bring their friends to the house on Saturdays or Sunday afternoons have a conversation with grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle about what are you thinking about where you are now and what you're about to do and give them a question and shock yourself at their answer. The point is, if we are going to continue with the essence of what all of this thought process is as adult, we must close that gap where our young people are concerned and get them involved. They are brilliant at preteens because they haven't been told yet that they're not. So I would encourage you to engage a program, create a program where your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews can become a part. And briefly, part of the summer opera camp that we hold in New York are four preteens with the music and the science and the drama. And those young people come and they, at the ages of nine through 16, with the help of some of us and this incredible scientist over here, Megan, do some incredible work in five weeks. Those young people have already been engaged and are looking forward to continuing that. So just on a basis of where there are two or more of us, we can, have a, we can have a party, start having those kinds of life endearing parties 
with your young people. So then when we get here to conferences of this nature, there are those same young, brilliant minds. You'd be amazed at a nine-year-old that we had in our summer camp who really should be finishing his master's degree right now in some university. Brilliant young people. So I'm just going to keep encouraging us to bring, fill that gap, bring in our young people. Bring in your preteens starting at age 10, as long as they are potty trained. I just wanted to uh, say one thing in response to Odile on this question of the financial system and so-called art, because I read maybe a year ago in the New York papers about the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is just a glorious, huge institution, and you know, uh, you go in and you see Washington crossing the Delaware, and it's amazing, um, and it is completely cash starved to the point that now admission used to be free or whatever you could donate, you could put in a dollar and go. Now uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, if you do not have a New York State driver's license, it's $25 just to go to the museum. But the Museum of Modern Art, where they have been known to have such things as a pile of cow manure on the floor and call it an exhibit, is just overflowing with money uh, from Wall Street. And please don't consider, remember what I said about what happened in the 1960s, or we've written plenty about the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the imposition of ugliness on people to make human beings confused about the nature of man is not an accident. And much of what people think is their own opinion is not their opinion. It was created or people went along with it because that's the only way you could get funding, like the scientists who say that the world is going to boil over and things like that. You cannot get funding unless you go with what these financial powers want you to do. And I'm convinced, obviously, what we surround ourselves with has an effect on what we consider our identity. The first time I went to the Capitol building in Washington, I was so blown away by the beauty of the architecture, I found it really hard to imagine that the people in there could be doing such ugly, stupid policies <laughs> because you would think they'd want to rise to the beauty of what they were surrounded by. But no, but this question of the funding that's why all these orchestras, if they want to survive, they do these hideously <laughs> ugly so-called modern music, which is completely arbitrary, because they will not get a grant and they won't be allowed to exist unless they do that. And unfortunately, people are trained to pour much more passion, right? Me, Oh, and you you know, this is supposed to be very moving and you can make a million dollars, but if you're doing something that's really beautiful, it's played as if it was a bunch of corpses. So these things are not accidental and we really have to fight for this and um, don't uh, go along to get along or accept ugliness being crammed down our throats. Is it work? Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Clara, and um, I wanted to give a thanks, um, and, and this is about El Elvira. You were just talking about how um, it's good to start with, with teenagers that's young, but you said around 10. Well, uh, the Schiller Institute, uh, for the first time I met them, I was around that age. I was 11, perhaps 12. And that was because I had a sister who, five years older than me, who discovered it by a, another relative. And um, it started with her beginning to sing opera in the house, which I hated. It was awful, you know, it was noisy and no, nobody in our family liked that kind of stuff. But she insisted and she was singing the whole house. 
And then she started talking to me about it. She couldn't talk with our mother. She was totally blocked. And uh, she began showing me, oh, there's this guy Shakespeare, and oh, there's this Plato. And, and then when I got older, and I did some, because it was kind of fun. We had this thing together. And I got older, and she would try to, you know, she was at coming at the office in Copenhagen. And, and she would try to take me with her. So I was 13, giving out flyers. I had no clue what I was doing. Like, I was just with my sister, you know? And um, then she actually uh, introduced me to Kepler and Schiller and uh, many other great, great people, uh, LaRouche. And uh, I, I think it's quite amazing that um, the, the education system, they did not take responsibility for my education. Um, but the Schiller Institute did through my sister. <laughs> so thank you all for fighting and, and you know, keep on doing these things because if you hadn't, I would never have known about it and I don't know where I would have been. So thank you very much. So I think since this is the conclusion of the conference, it would be appropriate for Helga to give us her closing thoughts and opening <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> well, I just would like to connect to what Sarah just said because the problem is actually much bigger uh, than just you know the young generation. I mean, it's there is a mind genocide, menticide. Menticide. Uh, there are now many, many studies um, that <clears throat> the combined effect of uh, overuse of dig digital media, of smartphones, playstations, uh, you know, some, some babies get, get a smartphone at the age of one uh, by the parents so that they, they just are quiet and so forth. Now, there are many studies which um, show that there is irreparable damage made in the mind of the young children because the way, you know, when, when a child watches only electronic devices, um, the synapses of the brain connect in a completely different way as if the child is socially interacting. And you know, I think that, you know, if you take that, and it has severe cognitive um, effects that, that people just do not develop certain creative potentials to think. Uh, so this is a real big problem. You know, it's, it's, it's also in China a problem, but the difference is that in China people are aware of it and they're trying to counteract it, while in the West they are not, which is why I have made the point if people are worried about a, a a fight between the systems, you know, we don't need to worry if the West is not changing, we just have to wait a couple of years and, and we are gone anyway, you know, so it, it's not China which is the problem, it's the unwillingness of the West to change. And if you take that with the effects of the drug epidemics, the alcoholism, the depression because of, you know, other social factors like unemployment, poverty and so forth, I think we have a real breakdown of civilization in the West, and it's not being discussed. I think that this is something which we have to really get um, a much different approach to, and, and I want to actually ask you all to become more active. You know, you are all obviously in agreement, at least to a very large part of what has been discussed in the last two days, but I, I really would like, you know, as your abilities are, but I would like from each of you a certain degree of commitment to do something to cause this change which is needed. So that we are not leaving this conference just you know, having thought about Lynn and the world and so forth. But you know, I think I'm so serious about keeping the legacy of Lynn alive. And I actually want to have a situation where you know, his ideas become more powerful than when he was alive. You know, and I think that this is not something arbitrary, this is an absolute necessary thing. 
So rather than just contemplating about it, I would ask each of you, like, like Schiller did at the end of his lecture on universal history, he said, you know, all, each of you can contribute something. Some of you can go with us out to organize. Some of us can go uh, <clears throat> using social media to spread the existence of this movement. Others can you know, organize speeches, um, you know, conferences. You can help us to get more members. Um, you can set up lectures for us on the different subjects, on science, on, <clears throat> on energy, on why the Green New Deal doesn't function. You know, there are so many subjects. You can help us to create a school. You know, um, Antonella, uh, uh, <coughs> Diane, uh, Elvira School, you know, of, of having many young children, you know, come to, to learn music. And I, I, I'm absolutely con con convinced that if every child on this planet would have the chance to learn to sing in a classical way from the very beginning, uh, if every child would learn an instrument and have, you know, access to universal history and natural science, we could end oligarchism forever. Because the only reason why these oligarchs are capable of continuing their rule is because they have an enormous amount of passive citizens, of people who accept to be underlings, of people who, you know, just say there's nothing one can do about it anyway, you know. And since uh, <clears throat> Um, Stefan Ossenkopf was so kind to remind myself that I should be chancellor of this country. You know, I remember that I made once a, a promise that if I'm ever chancellor of this country, I would put, uh, if somebody says this sentence, I ca you can't do anything anyway, I would make a law or have a law made that this person would go into the dungeon for 10 years. <laughs> because, because you have to have an absolute deterrence against this sense of, of political impotence that you can't do anything. You know, we are right now at, a, at an unbelievable change of epoch. You now, if you review in your mind what was discussed over these last two days, there is no question that this system is coming to an end. We don't know yet what will be the new system, but we know what are the principles on which the new system must be built. Uh, that is not a complete answer, but we know at least the direction in which we have to go. It is very much in line with what Lynn's life work has been, namely you know, that you have to move away from the realm of opinion you know, because that belongs to the liberal world where every opinion is equally good to the other one. And if you say, you know, what Lynn said already in the 90s, you know, it's, it's my pleasure uh, or it's not my pleasure to change my gender 10 times a day, you know, but that is what we have today. But that we have to move to the idea where truth seeking is what, what defines the social life among people. I mean, <coughs> For example, Norbert Breinin uh, was <clears throat> one of the best friends of, of Lynn. Uh, and he, he said that what, what signifies a great musician or a great artist and a great scientist is truth seeking. That you never, never give up to come more close to the truth of what the late string quartets of Beethoven were supposed to be. And he described how the Amadeus Quartet was rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing until they thought that they come as close to the truth of Beethoven's intention on that day as they possibly could. And it is, you never find the truth because the universe is a changing universe and human activity is a driving force in that changing universe. So truth is not some fact or some static thing you arrive at, but it is the directionality of improvement, of perfection, of making yourself a better human being, of trying to get better conditions for all of mankind, of understanding more of the principles of the physical universe, of making new discoveries, of moving to new economic platforms as a result of all of this activity. And you know, to be in tune with that lawfulness of the universe and in tune with history is really you know, what, what 
will be the future new paradigm. So the discussion, what the new paradigm has to be, is being discussed in many countries. It's discussed in Asia. I was in May at this Asian Dialogue of Civilization, and people are discussing what should be the rules of the new system. What should be the principles, not rules, but principles of the new system, which make sure that mankind is in cohesion with natural law. And I think that that is the great challenge of our particular time. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think the best thing we can do to, you know, pay tribute to the memory of, of Lyndon LaRouche is to become serious in this respect. So I want to say goodbye to you and hope to see you in activity with us very, very soon. Thank you. That concludes our conference. Join a chorus.